Hello, this is Pastor Wayne McDowell, and I want to thank you for taking the opportunity to watch this message preached from the platform of Deeper Fellowship Church. We believe that the things that the Lord is saying here will be life transforming for you. If it's a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to share this message with your friends. If it's a continual blessing to you, the best way for you to receive more messages is to click the subscribe button. I pray that this message is a blessing to your life and that it takes deep root in your heart as you join us on this journey at Deeper Fellowship Church, where we endeavor to cultivate a deeper fellowship with God and one another. Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21. Um, I endeavor, I know what time it is. I know that we, we sang longer, we praised longer, and all of that was worth it. And God did more in that moment than he could do in my preaching. But I do want to make sure that we leave here with the word of the Lord. So I will, I will go quick. Um, Quick and fast are two different things. Okay, I will go quick. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and all the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked, and the crowds replied, it is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's, I'll stop here. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you've already done in our gathering today. I thank you for what has happened in your presence. I thank you for the freedom that we've experienced in your presence. I thank you for the way that you revealed yourself. Now, I pray that you would reveal yourself through your word to your people. Father, I pray that you would anoint me to proclaim the word and you would anoint me to do it with authority, with power, and also to do it expeditiously while at the same time the people receiving everything that they need to receive. Now make us good soil. Make our hearts good soil to receive the word of the Lord. Let it go deep in our hearts and may it produce a harvest. Now, Father, I pray that you would anoint me to proclaim your word. And as always, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And because of your goodness and mercy and your grace, would you reveal Jesus and save people in this room and watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. Um, today uh, is known as, I'll let those who are walking stop walking, and then we will jump into the word. That way we won't be distracted. Amen. Today is known as Palm Sunday. It is Palm Sunday, and uh, what most of the, the, the headings of our scripture, if we were to read uh, throughout the scripture, whether it is Matthew 21, whether it is Luke 19, whether it is in Mark or John, which all of these have, um, what you will see um, in the heading, it accurately reads as the triumphal entry of Jesus. It is the triumphal entry of Jesus. And as we come to Palm Sunday, uh, what is of most interest to me is why it is defined as a triumphal entry, especially when viewed in the light of the events that would unfold over the next several days in the life of Jesus. This is um, what is known as the beginning of the week of his passion or, or the week that Jesus uh, ultimately suffered, bled, died, and resurrected from the dead. And so the fact that this particular event is called the triumphal entry uh, was very interesting to me because of what would happen to Jesus in that week. He would be falsely accused and betrayed and beaten beyond recognition and tortured and whipped and reviled and spat on and mocked and ridiculed 
killed, crowned with thorns, abandoned by his followers and disciples, denied, crucified, naked on a cross, stabbed in the side with a spear, and ultimately placed in a borrowed tomb. Now, thank God that even after all of that happened, which should have happened to us, by the way, but he took that for us. Thank God that after all of that happened, because he is God and God alone, he would not stay in that borrowed tomb, but instead he would rise from the dead and on the third day uh, rise with all power in his hand, having the key to death, hell, and the grave. And so I'm so glad. That's a good reason for a Christian to clap right there. I'm not going to be long, and I will be even shorter if you will respond. Now y'all going to be like, amen, amen, amen. (laughs) It would seem like after rising from the dead that the triumphal entry would be known at that point. For example, if you look in in Matthew chapter 2, what it reads about his birth is this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? For we saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. In other words, not only when Jesus was born were there there wise men from the east that came, not just three, uh, but wise men from the east that came, but also the heavens were declaring the birth of the Lord. Luke records that when Jesus was born, the hosts of heaven were present. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 verse 8 that that night there were shepherds staying in the field nearby guarding their flocks of sheep and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them and they were terrified but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes the Messiah the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David and you will recognize them by this sign, you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, and suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God, saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. You would think that if he had that kind of entry when he was born, that literally the heavens declared it, the stars declared it, wise men came from the east, there are gifts, there are angels showing up, and the hosts of heaven are singing over him as he is born, that sounds like a triumphal entry. It sounds like a triumphal entry to us in modern times. Yet what we read in Matthew 21 and also in Luke 19 on the surface, what we see is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And people spread out their garments on the road and some people cut branches from palm trees. And to us that might not seem like a big deal, but both in the natural and in the the spirit, what Jesus knew about his prophetic future, it was a very big deal. Now listen, I know uh, that for those of us who may have grown up in church when we got to the Sunday before Easter, we're like, all right, it's Palm Sunday and isn't isn't this exciting? And you're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to go to church. It's it's Palm Sunday. And, And maybe if you grew up in more traditional settings, they might have even gave you a little palm leaf for something to have and, and wave and stuff like that. And you're like, okay, it's Palm Sunday. Yay, what are we doing? What is this about? What does this mean? But okay, Palm Sunday, amen. Now, I know some of y'all, you're like, oh, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong with you. I always knew what Palm Sunday was. I, okay. But for the rest of us, why, why, don't we, why don't we talk about the power of Palm Sunday? Can we, talk, can we talk about the power of Palm Sunday for, for just a moment? Because I think it's very, very important for us to understand the power of Palm Sunday. Uh, because in ancient times, palm branches symbolized goodness and victory. So the fact that people laid them out in front of Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem shows us that his journey to the cross and resurrection was a journey to victory. In other words, Jesus was like, listen, uh, they, they were basically saying, we recognize that he's somebody different. We recognize him as a mistake. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had this in the first service. We recognize him as the Messiah. And so literally, they were, whenever a conquering king would conquer or, or be victorious, they would wave palm branches. And so literally, as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, they have these palm branches that they're waving. It's literally people acknowledging him as the Messiah. And there was a level of prophetic symmetry in this because when John was on the island of Patmos and he had the revelation of Jesus, um, he wrote this in Revelation 
Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, he says, After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne before the Lamb, and they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hand. This is in heaven, y'all. They held palm branches in their hand and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And so literally, palm branches on the earth signifying victory, palm branches in the spirit signifying victory and all laid before Jesus. Now, now I want you to understand the power of the moment that you are in and the power of the day that you're in and specifically the power of this particular moment that we celebrate because part of what makes it triumphant is not just the symbolism of victory, but what makes it triumphant is the fact that he allowed it at all. Because for the three years of Jesus' public ministry, oftentimes you would see moments where he would do something and he would tell the people, don't say anything. He would heal somebody. He'd say, don't tell anybody. Of course they would go tell it. But Jesus would say, don't, don't say anything. Don't, don't tell anyone about this. Don't, don't tell anyone who raised your daughter. Don't, don't tell anyone who healed you. Or he would just simply slip through the crowd because he had an assignment to fulfill and he wasn't going to allow anything or anyone from keeping him from filling that, fulfilling that assignment. He was going to do every bit of the work that the Father sent him to fulfill and he was going to fulfill every single prophetic word and because he knew who he was and because he knew his prophetic destiny he was saying listen I don't want the word to get out too soon because I know my destiny is to die but I cannot allow them to do it before I complete my work and so therefore he would say don't say it don't do anything that's why when his mother nudged him and said um Jesus they've run out of wine he said what does this have to do with me for my time has not yet come in other words he was saying listen I I know there's a destiny that I have to fulfill. There are things I have to do. Don't make me show who I am too early. But it's something about the power of a mother. She's just like, okay, go ahead and do it. He's like, all right, I'm going to do this, but shh. Because he knew that every work that he did tilted the slope towards death. So therefore, he was saying, don't don't tell this thing too early. But in this moment, the power of this moment is the fact that after three years of doing things in secret and doing things to not necessarily make a loud announcement and a loud statement about who he was, on this particular day, on this particular moment, he literally allows the announcement of who he is to be boldly declared. He's saying, I am not about to deny who I am am now. Uh, Before you might have been confused, but I'm not going to allow there to be any confusion. Now, there is a king that is coming down the street. There is a king that is coming down the road. And I know that it may not be in chariots, and I know it might not be a big team of horses, and I know it might not be a bunch of trumpets, but I want you to know that the king is here. And it was a power that had reverberations in that moment that were felt. The Jews felt it. The religious leaders felt it felt it, children felt it, Rome felt it, and I guarantee you the devil felt it because there was something that Jesus said, all right, I've been doing some things and you've been wondering, is this the Christ? You've been wondering, is this the one? But now you're going to know for sure I am who I am and I came to do what I came to do and it's not a secret anymore. I'm on my way to victory. I know I got to go through the cross, but to me, the cross is not defeat. The cross it's victory and I'm on my way Jesus riding in on a donkey knowing exactly what he was doing fulfilling prophecy but the scripture says in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 rejoice O people of Zion shout in triumph O people of Jerusalem look your king is coming to you he is righteous and victorious yet he is humble riding on a donkey riding on a donkey's colt or as it says in Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11 the Lord has sent this message to every land tell the people of Israel look your savior is coming see he brings his reward with him as he comes in fulfilling prophecy in this moment he's making a loud 
statement about his divinity, about his authenticity, about his authority that as the Messiah Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He was coming as a savior for the people. He was coming to upset the religious leaders of the day and he was coming to destroy the works of the devil. He came on a donkey, but he came with a purpose. I'm coming to be a savior. I'm coming to upset religious leaders of the day and I am coming to destroy the works of the devil. This day was certainly a triumphal entry. It was as if to say, if you didn't know who I was before, you know now. If you were wondering, wonder no more. If it wasn't clear to you before, let me make it clear. This is who I am. I am fulfilling prophetic destiny. The things that the prophets have spoke about, I'm him. Yeah. Hallelujah. It was a scene. The scripture says the entire city was in an uproar and Jesus was at the center of the procession. The humility of Jesus is that he's riding on a donkey, but the authority of Jesus is that he allowed palms and praise. I'm going to say it again. The humility of Jesus is that he's riding on a donkey, but the authority of Jesus, he didn't tell anybody, put those palms down. Palms are reserved for kings. No, I'm the king of kings. Go ahead and wave those palm branches because go ahead and make the announcement. Go ahead and tell Rome. Go ahead and tell Jerusalem. Go ahead and tell the religious leaders, the king is here. The king is here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, interesting, interesting to me, because Luke records, Luke records in Luke chapter 19, verse 37, it says, when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they've seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. But he replied, if they keep quiet, quiet, the stones on the road would burst into cheers. If you wonder why we spent so long singing in church and you're not at lunch right now, it's because we seen too much to be quiet. If you're wondering why we spend the time that we do, I know that religious leaders and other churches can say they sing too long. Their services are too long. You can't grow that way. You're offending people. No, no, no. Because Jesus said, listen, I I can't tell them to deny what they've seen. I can't tell them to deny who they know me to be because even if I told them to be quiet, the very rocks would cry out. That's why I love the fact that the script, that the song used to say, I ain't gonna let no rock cry out for me. I don't need a rock to cry out in my place. He's been too good for me to be quiet. And I want you to know that even if you were, creation would sing. Tell them, tell them to be quiet. Tell them to be quiet. Tell them, tell them to stop. Tell them they can't, they can't sing like that. Tell, no, 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 he's been too good. <laughs> Help me preach real quick and say, ain't no rock gonna praise for me. tell you a little too proper just say I won't let a rock cry out in my place and after you get through your little proper something just say hallelujah <laughs> why y'all so loud cause if I don't the rocks will cry out <laughs> Now, I found this to be interesting about this particular day, this particular, this particular moment in, in, in history, this, this particular moment at the beginning of his passion. Um, Luke um, actually gives us insight into what is happening or going on internally with Jesus as all this is going on around him. You would think, he would think, wow, this is, this is the moment. This is the moment I've been 
preparing for all my life. This is the moment that I've been waiting for all my life. This is the reason why I was sent. This is, this is being fulfilled. The, 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 you would think that that's what's going on inside of him, but, but Luke actually gives an interesting uh, view or peer into the internal parts of Jesus um, in Luke chapter 19 because all this is going on around him. The Pharisees are saying, tell your followers to be quiet. The palms are happening. People are laying their coats on the road. He's riding in as a triumphant king. He's acknowledging, I am the Messiah. He's not telling anybody, don't tell anyone now. He's saying, go ahead, make this announcement. All this is happening. And while this is happening, something else is happening too. But as he comes closer to Jerusalem, Luke 19, 41, and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. <laughs> All this is going on around him. But as he comes closer to the city, he begins to weep. And he says these words, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late. So now he's weeping and prophesying. <laughs> but now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you and your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Literally, on this donkey, pedantry around him, weeping, what a scene prophesying what is getting ready to happen to the people and to the temple that they so love. Hmm. Now, it is undeniable what the centerpiece of Jerusalem is. The very reason why people made pilgrimage to Jerusalem in those times was for the temple. And as he comes closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he begins to weep, no doubt looking at the temple. Because he's looking at the temple and he's saying the words that he's saying against the city and against the temple. Uh, plainly because they're, they're in their view of the temple or, or their view of religious activity caused them to believe that because of the temple, they were safe from anything that God may want to do or they were safe from wrath and judgment. And so literally what is happening is um, we look at it and we stop there and we basically say, okay, um, the palms are happening and everyone's celebrating and it's great big celebration and everything else. But Jesus is looking at Jerusalem and he's specifically looking at the temple or he's specifically looking at religious activity saying, you think you're safe because you're religious. You think you're safe because you do some things in my name. You, you think you're safe because you do things in the name of God. You think that nothing will actually happen to you based on the way that you live. And you even have a phrase that you use in that day. We're safe because of the temple. And he's saying, no, no, no. You don't understand that you literally tried to find peace apart from me. And you can't find peace apart from the Prince of Peace. And because you tried to find peace apart from the Prince of Peace, you are going to discover now that 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 was a futile attempt and the very thing that you think gives you peace is about to be destroyed. Let me let you know that if anybody in this room or anybody in the world thinks that you can find peace apart from Jesus, it is a futile activity. He is the prince of peace. He is the source of peace. He is the place where we find peace. He is a place that we run to and there is no peace outside of him. Trying to hold peace without holding Jesus is like trying to hold the wind. You cannot do it. Jesus is the only source of peace and if you don't recognize it when he comes you will discover that the thing that you built that caused you to think you have peace even if it's religious activity will be destroyed you said now pastor isn't this Palm Sunday supposed to be a happy message? Well, well, Jeremiah saw this long before. He begins to prophesy about this long before God speaking to his people through the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah chapter 7 says this in verse 4, but don't be fooled by those who promise you safety just because the Lord's temple is here. In other words, don't be fooled who promise you safety just by saying if you just come to church, everything will be all right. You got to live this thing. <laughs> you, you don't just get to check off an attendance box on the road. You, you actually got to live this thing. Don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start, stop, and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your you're murdering and you stop harming your
yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave to your ancestors to keep forever. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because a temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, and burn incense to Baal or anybody else? Let me just throw that in. Or all these other new gods of yours and then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant we are safe only to go right back to all those evils again don't you yourselves admit that this temple which bears my name has become a den of thieves surely I see all the evil going on I the Lord have spoken what is in the mind of Jesus as he's approaching the temple in Jerusalem is Jeremiah 7 Here's Jesus riding on a donkey, fulfilling prophecy with an intense emotion because he knows that people were treating his father's house like it was their house. Treating his father's house like they had no respect. Treating his father's house like they could control who can come in and who can come out and who's worthy and who's unworthy. Treating his father's house like it was something that did not need to be treated. And so now he is riding on a donkey. But I want you to know the power of Palm Sunday is that while he's riding in on a donkey as the king of kings, he's also riding to his father's house to take back his father's house and to set things in order. If you really want to know the power of Palm Sunday, it was the day that Jesus set his house in order. The prophets saw this day ahead of time. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Look, I am sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. That sounds good. We're like, oh yes, even so come Lord Jesus. But if you keep reading, verse 2 says, but who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver so they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. This is Jesus on the day of the triumphal entry with palm branches being waved and laid down before him, but also about to take back what belongs to his father. Now, I know we have a certain image of Jesus, one that we have curated over millennia with paintings and and beautiful chapels and everything else. And now we have this imagination of Jesus being this this, this, um, unemotional, nice, but wimpy guy. That, that's what we have. We, we, we have this, this view that he's just somebody who skips through the sunflower fields all day saying, I just love you, and I love you, and I love you, and look at the birds, and look at the trees, and he gets us. You missed it. You missed that one. You missed that one. You missed that one. I'm going to leave it alone. For those who know, no. This Jesus on Palm Sunday, with the palms, the celebration, the pageantry, the praise, the songs, all of this surrounding him, riding on a donkey, weeping, prophesying. But when he gets to where he's going, this Jesus that we've created, that is weak and doesn't confront anybody and doesn't confront anything and lets everything just go on and says nothing because somehow or another it's just this is what love does. It doesn't confront anything. Um, th- th- this, this Palm Sunday, Jesus shows up at the temple on Palm Sunday and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 21 verse 12 Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice and he knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves oh that, that's not the, the Jesus that, that, that most of us picture on Palm Sunday 
This is what happened on palm. You got your palms out? Okay. Now, 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 when Jesus gets to where he's going to go, scene, set, action, he's about to go in here and about to tear up some stuff. He's about to say, I'm about to get my father's house back. Uh, you, you, he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple shall be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. And so literally what happens on Palm Sunday is Jesus shows up in his father's house and he starts to kick out everybody who does not belong in his father's house doing the things that they should not be doing in his father's house, turning over tables. John gets more descriptive and he says this, Jesus got a whip and started whipping people and beating them out of the house. I know that ain't the Jesus. Listen, Jesus wasn't a punk. He wasn't soft. He wasn't a punk. He spoke to devils and made them flee and he made the money changers and the thieves in the temple. He kicked them out. He turned over tables and he said, no, this is not what my father's house is supposed to be. Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday. This is Jesus. Jesus says, the scripture declares. It's interesting because when he was in the wilderness, he's talking to the tempter. He says, the scripture declares. Now he shows up in the temple and some people doing some things they're not supposed to be doing. He says, the scripture declares, he is hearkening back to something. He says, the scriptures declare, my temple shall be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Now, it is a house of prayer. For the Lord named it that. What Jesus is quoting is the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, Isaiah chapter 56 verse 7 says this, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Say it again. My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now, when we read and hear these words, we place the emphasis on house of prayer. And this is correct. You are not incorrect to, to, to place the emphasis on the house of prayer. Uh, the house of God is to be a house of prayer. It's a house of presence. It's a house of encounter. It's a house of all these things. But it is also supposed to be a house of prayer. It's a, it's a house of bread. Uh, it's, a, it's a number of things. But it is to be a house of prayer. It is to be a house of reverence. It is to be a house of worship. And, and you are not wrong when you, when you hear these words that my, my house shall be called a house of prayer when you automatically put one and one together and say there ought to be prayer in the house of God. This is true. There ought to be prayer in the house of God. However, if we leave the inference, emphasis on the inference of prayer only there, then we could possibly miss the context of what Jesus was saying. He was speaking for the Father while quoting the prophet Isaiah to do so when he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But because he was quoting the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah gave this prophecy in a context. So I want us to look at the context. I'm almost done, like I actually am. This isn't my first pre-close. <laughs> Isaiah prophesied the word of the Lord, but listen to the context in which these words are spoken. Thank you, Warren, because I really was almost done. He believed me. <laughs> this is what the Lord says. Be just and fair to all. Do what is right and good, for I am coming soon to rescue you and display my righteousness among you. Blessed are those who are careful to do this. Blessed are those who honor my Sabbath days of rest and keep themselves from doing wrong. Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say the Lord will never let me be a part of his people. Can I say that part again? Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say the Lord will never let me be part of his people. Why do I stop right there? Because I want you to understand the context of who this was being spoken to. The foreigners are any non-Jews. 
I, I know we live in a very hypersensitive uh, time right now, even in our own nation as it relates to borders. And so you think everybody's a foreigner, uh, but the amalgam of that which makes America is somehow uh, different. I need us to, to kind of come back to the context of this day. Foreigners is any non-Jew. So that's a Gentile, which happens to be you and I. So, so literally, God prophesying through Isaiah says, don't let foreigners who commit themselves. The Lord said, the Lord will never let me be a part of his people. Don't let the eunuchs say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. I will also bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath days of rest and who hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. For the sovereign Lord who brings back the outcasts of Israel says, I will bring others too besides my people of Israel. Now, something was happening that upset Jesus and it wasn't that prayer wasn't happening in the house. The reason I can tell you that is because even to this day, there are Jews praying at the Western Wall, day and night. The Wailing Wall, it is called. Um, the Western Wall of the Temple, the ruins that remain, there are people that are praying right now. 24-7 prayer didn't begin with the church in America. It has been going on for thousands of years. So then was Jesus upset that there was no prayer in the house of prayer? Or was he upset that his house was to be called a house of prayer for all nations? But somehow or another, people had decided to keep others out. The power of Palm Sunday, because I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. Um, the power of Palm Sunday is the fact that on the way to his triumph, he made sure that you got to as well. My father's house is to be called a house of prayer for all nations, and you have made it a den of thieves. Now, of course, we know that there were people that were buying and selling and merchandising in the temple, specifically selling doves and selling sacrifices and everything else, but, but what we don't understand is what they were essentially saying is we decide who's worthy and who's not. We decide who can come and who cannot, and therefore, what they were doing in the house of God was setting up a system of who could come to God and who could not. And as a result, Jesus is like, this is not what my father's house is for. In my father's house, anyone who wants to commit themselves to him can come to him. In my father's house, anyone who wants to commit themselves to him can come to him. I'm going to say it again. In my father's house, anyone who wants to commit themselves to him can come to him. And the power of Palm Sunday is this, that when Jesus got to his destination, he wanted to make sure before I leave here and before... This temple is destroyed because he said of himself what upset the religious leaders so much in Matthew chapter 12 verse 6 is I am greater than the temple. Because there will be another temple not made by hand. And anybody who comes to me will allow my spirit to fill that temple. And you're so hung up on this temple that you are about to demonstrate to people something that should never be demonstrated. That everybody can't come. But I need you to know that whosoever will, let him come. And this temple not made by hands will be filled by my spirit. And I want to make sure that I set things right. And I don't leave this earth 
without setting things right in my father's house. You are not going to build a house that tells people that they cannot come to the father. No, no, no. You are not going to build a house that gives them false ideology. You are not going to build a house that gives them false theology. You are not going to build a house that teaches another gospel. You are not going to build a house that teaches materialism. You are not going to build a house that teaches prosperity but does not teach Jesus. I'm going to fix my father's house before I leave here because there is another house. Hallelujah. Jesus did something. And I'm going to finish with this. He did something that I think is amazing. The Gentiles, foreigners, stayed on the outer part. And imagine this. Um, if, if I get a little upset, my children know that's probably not the best time to come to me and ask me for something. <laughs> I mean, a child can figure that out. If maybe, hey, daddy, what? Never mind, I'll come back. <laughs> Jesus had just got finished whipping. <laughs> and I mean, this is going to be crazy to y'all. I was in a certain city in a certain nation. I leave it out. And we were trying to get to our destination, but it's very crowded because it's a very populated city in a very populated nation. And there was a, a security detail in front of us, and they had a guy in the back of the truck with a whip. Exactly. Whipping the people to move them out the way <laughs> so we could get through. I said, ain't nobody going to want to worship now. <laughs> I ain't lifting my hand at all. For you know. <laughs> Jesus turning over tables according to John with a whip. And yet in this moment, because he wanted to set things right, he, the Bible says that he literally, the lame and the sick came to him and he healed them. Isn't that amazing? In this same moment, Palm Day, turning over the tables, the whip is out making declarations about the destruction of the temple, weeping on the donkey, making a declaration in my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Let me demonstrate it to you. Let me go to the people that you won't let in. Let me go to them and heal them. Let me go to the people that you think are unclean. Let me go heal them. Let me go to let them come to me because this is what my father's house is supposed to be like. My father's house is supposed to be a place where anybody can come and anybody can get healed. And I'm so glad that on the triumphal entry, on the day that he knew what was coming for the rest of the week, <laughs> he said, uh, let me stop by first and fix your idea of the father's house. Let me stop by here and fix your idea of what you think religion is. Let me stop by here and fix your idea. Some of you, systems have kept you out and how others treat you have kept you out and how others talk about you have kept you out and how others think about you has kept you out and how others treat you has kept you out. But Jesus made sure that on his triumphal entry, if you'd come to him, you too. You and I, we'd also be able to have a triumphal entry. He wanted to make sure. He wanted to make sure that my father's house is a house for everybody. <laughs>